1 Thessalonians, please, chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 10, 11, and 12. And here's my question. What is our highest goal in life as believers? To glorify God. To glorify God is our highest goal goal in life as believers. My next question is this, how attentive are we to this goal? Do we have room to grow in our attentiveness? What am I hearing over there? Oh, yes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> there's, there's a, this is a pretty neat passage of scripture. I've been wanting to preach something like this for some time, and I'm happy to be able to share it with you this evening. The title of this, uh, my, my message is simply this, Walk Worthy of God. It's right in the text. Walk Worthy of God. And any of us would right away say, How in the world can my walk be equivalent to the value of God, who he is and what he has done for us. Well, we're here to look at some of that and uh, be able to gain some interesting insight into the view of the future, a view of the future that can make a real difference. It can be directing and motivating this view of the future that's in these verses, particularly in verse 12. Verses 10 and 11 and 12 say this, You are witnesses in God also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So here's the example here is not the church at Thessalonica. The example in these three verses is the Apostle Paul and Silas and Timothy. He is describing their, their ministry in part to this church when they were there in person, when they first came to Thessalonica. And he begins in verse 10 by describing godly behavior as a minister of the gospel, as a minister of the word. Uh, Paul's exemplary ministry, he, he gets right into it. He goes, you are witnesses, and God also, it, it's interesting, uh, he, he's calling them to, to just to testify in their minds that, yeah, this is the kind of ministry this is the kind of behavior the Apostle Paul had among us. And, and, and Paul was serving before God and, and recognized and acknowledged that God is also aware of how, how we minister to one another, how we relate to one another. And then he gives three descriptive words describing his godly behavior among them how devoutly, how, would, would uh, suggest a, a level. It's not just devoutly, it's how devoutly. And justly and blamelessly, we behaved ourselves among you who believe. Devoutly has to do with, it comes from a word, I believe it has to do with holy. It's God's standard for conduct. The Apostle Paul sought to have a holy behavior in his ministry to people winning them to Christ, making disciples, and then teaching them to grow. Justly is another word, similar, but not exactly the same. It has to do with righteous toward them and how he related and ministered to them. Unblameably has to do with unchargeable, or the concept of his character was such that you could, it, it holds up to careful evaluation. You could look at Paul this way and that way and that way and the other way, and you wouldn't find something that would, you could blame him for. He was, he was an honoring uh, uh, a man who honored the Lord in his life. As a matter of fact, I could say it this way. He is describing Paul, Silas, and Timothy as mannerly men in their ministry 
to the church at Thessalonica. Look back with me, verses 5 through 9. We'll review here a little bit because it describes there as well their character. You could do a quick work. You'll notice uh, the different phrases and expressions that he uses. Uh, in, his, in his work to assure the Thessalonians, um, it's just amazing how much effort he put into relationally with them. Verse 5, for neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. They preached the word as it was given to them. They did not, as we, we studied last week in verse 4. They honored the Lord in the delivery of the word of God. Nor did we seek glory from men. They weren't out to get a pat on the back or recognition or any of those kinds of things, either from you or from others. When we might have, he said, they might have, they, they, they certainly had the capability of making demands as apostles of Christ, but they didn't. Instead, he says, but we were gentle. He's describing his exemplary ministry and the way he carried about himself in the church at Thessalonica. We were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. Don't forget this, please. How can we be gentle toward each other? How can we be caring toward each other? And, and uh, in this way, with this, with this um, illustration that he gave. And then he says, so affectionately longing for you. Again, take off the word so, and you have affectionately longing, but you add the word so, which is there, it, it describes a level of, of affection. It adds to the concept of what he's conveying here. So affectionate, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, meaning he didn't mind giving up sleep, work, or other things so he could be with God's people and minister to them. He worked hard. He worked hard for them. He gave up for them. To impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil. He's talking about his, his, uh, his uh, where do we get this phrase, tent making from? for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. He didn't want to have to depend on them and cause that to be a, a burden to them, provide his daily needs. He said, we preach to you the gospel of God. What a loving description of a minister of the word and how, how they saw that, experienced that, and God, God did as well, of course, you know, it's the proper behavior is a biblical requirement, isn't it? But what else is it? It's a very appealing and winsome behavior. It's, it's, it's very appealing and winsome behavior. It's Christ-like. And, and it's a demonstration. What he is talking about, essentially, there is the character of Christ that God had developed in him. Remember what he was before he got saved? He was, a, he was a zealous Pharisee who was headed to Damascus to find other Christians to drag into prison or to find a way to destroy them or kill them. What a change God made in this man's life to be loving of Jew and Gentile in, in, in beautiful ways, beautiful ways described there. His behavior is exemplary. It's appealing, it's winsome. And for us, as we minister, whether it's in, in, a, in a life group or a disciple group or preaching, uh, teaching in other ways, uh, there's an example for us to follow. Here's uh, witnessing, uh, sharing Christ with people and seeking to um, see them get saved. It, th there's this this winsome appeal, this character of God that's godly and appropriate and uh, that we would serve with this same kind of love and care for other people. 
Isn't it nice when somebody's kind to you? I mean, it, make, it makes an impression, doesn't it? And how we can be that way over and over, more and more by the grace of God to each other and to others that we, that we know, that we meet, that we minister to. What an example. And then he had this father-like teaching in verse 11. Not to be confused with people in churches, supposed churches, religions, false ones, that are called father. Not confusing that at all here. He talked about one spectrum, one end of the spectrum of his care is as gentle as a nursing mom. Now he's over here talking about how he taught them as a father. And you know, verse 11, as you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. Notice the phrase, every one of you received this kind of treatment, this kind of teaching, as a father does who? His own children. Not somebody else's, his own. How gracious and loving and invested is a father in ministering to his own. So here's the Apostle Paul saying, this is how we taught. And by the way, he was experienced enough in communicating by this time in his ministry that one word didn't describe his teaching ministry. He needed three. So he exhorted. He encouraged them to grow, to love, and to serve. And we'll look at ex some examples of that. He comforted. And he charged them. This word charged is different than another word that we looked at in Timothy a few weeks back. This word comes from the Greek word that refers to a martyr or a witness. It seems like what is being said when he said, when we charged you, that, it, that he was actually witnessing or sharing from personal experience the work that God had done in his own life. In relation to the gospel and salvation, in relation to spiritual growth that he's experienced and sharing from that experience and helping other people, uh, always be that kind of mindset, have that kind of mindset as we seek to minister to other people. To be able to personally witness and say, here's how God helped me in that trial, in a, in a situation like this. Here's, here's what God has done. Can I share with you? And by the way, when you're witnessing, if you haven't tried this yet, if you get so far in talking with someone, can I share with you how I have a relationship with God? how God gave me that relationship. I had opportunity to do that with a man who was, he was kind and polite and, and I could go back and he'd welcome me to the door. Uh, we borrowed some toboggans for the lady, ladies banquet, is that what it was for? From people who responded on Front Porch Forum in Shelburne. One of, one of the couples, it was a Jewish couple, talkative and friendly, welcoming, I got into the door, Matt, when I returned the sled, and uh, we chatted. We started talking and listening, and, and, uh, and I, you know, I think I had my Trinity Baptist Church coat on, and, uh, you know, started talking to him a little bit about the Lord, and he looked at me, he said, are you proselytizing? I mean, we're standing this far apart. Don, what would you say? Uh, yes, if you'll let me. Are you witnessing? Are you trying to win a convert? <laughs> so, so he goes on. He didn't want to stop talking. He went on to talk some more and talk some more. I said hi to his wife. She was friendly. Oh, this, was, this was comfortable. Uh, and then, then he told me his belief, which is in a nutshell is um, it's really rough out there, but it's going to get better in the world. It's going to get better and will be better when it gets better and everything's going to be okay. Something like that. Well, he told me his belief. So I said, can I tell you mine? Why not? He says, if you keep it in one sentence. I started thinking a little, then I started talking, and I couldn't make the sentence as long as I wanted, but I got it out. Friends, love people. If it's in their doorstep, 
on their doorstep, on their doormat, if it's at the store that you go to, if it's your neighbor, if you buy maple syrup from them. Love, love people. Be, be warm-hearted and, and mannerly if you're a man. You know, kind and, uh, uh, as, uh, as our Lord certainly was. And here, as we see the Apostle Paul just beaming with, with relationship skills and abilities that were just marvelous and beautiful. He had the tools for teaching, exhorted, comforted, and charged. His tone was exemplary. His style, his attitude just seems very appealing. He, and it is, isn't it? Pastor would agree, I'm sure. It's an amazing privilege to bring God's word to God's people. It's, it's not our doing. It's his calling, and we simply strive to share what, we, what we're learning and encourage other people. Now, let me ask you this. With this godly behavior and this father-like teaching, what was his message? It begins with the word that in verse 12. That you would walk worthy of, of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Father-like teaching uh, exemplary behavior. Let me try to explain this verse as well as I can. I, I'm learning as I go, but delighted to, to share what, I've, what I'm learning. That is, a, is an indicator of a, of a strong, it's a connecting word that shows reason, purpose. It really is the goal. It shows what the content was, what his, excuse me, not the content, but the goal of his teaching that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So the word call is in, calls is in the present tense. Calls, happening now, all right? There, there is another call that we've received. So Ephesians 4, 1, walk worthy of the calling to which you've been called, walk worthy of that, the vocation to which you have been called in the old King James, and, and that's, that, that was calling to salvation. This is a different call. This, that, that call happened in the past. This call is ongoing. What is it when you call somebody, if you're not just talking but you want them to come to you, what, you're asking them to come to you, right? If you're saying, hey, you know, of a mother, is Conrad walking yet? Somebody's, your little one walking yet? Almost. Almost. It won't be long you'll be calling him. Uh, come here now. No, no, come back here. You're wanting him to be where you are for good reason. Wait till he gets under a coat rack at the store and you can't find him. That happened to me. That's not fun. <laughs> uh, but you call so they'll come to you. God is calling us into his kingdom. The millennial kingdom. He's calling us. 1 Thessalonians 2.12 He's calling us. When we say kingdom, there's a lot of talk and discussion about it. I take it very straightforward. It was prophesied in the Old Testament in many ways to be a literal one kingdom with the Lord Jesus Christ ruling from, it, from Jerusalem. And the peace on this planet is described in, in remarkable ways. Satan will be bound for a thousand years. There, there's going to be, the animals will be fine. The children can be safe around what today are harmless creatures. And on and on and on, the peace of, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, the millennial kingdom. We understand that to be coming, and we'll study this more when we get to it in Thessalonians, that the next event on God's calendar is the rapture of the church where the Lord Jesus comes in the clouds, not to earth, but in the clouds, and he gathers up those who are dead in Christ, changes our body and their body, and it takes us home to be with him, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The next time period is seven years long, the, the tribulation, where a lot of God's judgment will happen, and the end result, in part, is that there will be a remnant of believing Israel that will be influenced by 144,000 Jews, believers, 
to welcome their Messiah for the first time as a nation. At his second coming, when he comes and, and, and lands on the Mount of Olives, and will, be, it will bring judgment and clean house and establish his kingdom for 1,000 years. It's amazing. It's as close as seven years from today. Why did the Lord Jesus say and pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? You know what I like? There's so much about the millennial kingdom. It lasts a lot longer than five, four years with a good president. It lasts a thousand years with an awesome God. God is calling us. So what do we see here? Walk worthy of God. And again, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's hard to get our minds, my mind all around that. And he's calling us, present tense, into his kingdom and glory. So the present tense call with the future kingdom and glory, we need to tie this together in our thinking. God is presently calling us into his kingdom. That doesn't mean, well, I'll explain later, but he's calling, he wants us to think about then. He wants us to be attentive to his glory now for then. It's, it's, it's tough to endure trials. But this is what the church at Thessalonica was very exemplary again at doing was endure they endured well and for us to learn to endure those trials well to live in a way that's worthy of God it directs us to honor him it motivates us it it gives us hope and assurance to endure the trials the difficulties the the stuff on this on this planet now would you say with me would you agree that walking worthy of God is a lot to live up to We try to live up to our family name. We try to honor, you know, and not do something that embarrasses our family. We try to live up to our church reputation, church's reputation, and, but to live up to and be worthy of God is, you know, we need to avoid sin. We need to be loving. We need to be faithful. We need to be hopeful. All of the things that we've already seen. I shared already that Ephesians 4.1, uh, well, it explains. Um, let's go there briefly. Ephesians 4.1 is another worthy call, uh, call to walking worthy. Ephesians 4.1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you or urge you to walk worthy of the calling which you are called. And I believe that calling is referred to in chapters 1, 2, and 3 as the salvation that God has saved us with. Walk worthy. What does worthy look like? I want to show you. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12, please. In a short span of Scripture, we see this concept come up three different times. And it's, it's encouraging an exemplary church to abound in their spiritual growth. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12. And may the Lord make you increase and abound. See the words increase and abound. In what? Something that they were already doing very well in love to one another and to all just as we do to you. May the Lord make you to increase and abound. Notice chapter 4, verse 1, please. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more. That abound is over and above just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. Abound more and more. Chapter 4, verse 10, please. I'm going to start in verse 9 for a little context. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, and indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia, What a compliment. But he follows that right up with, but we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. 
I think we're too settled in our Christian lives and not growing as much as we should be. Generally speaking, I can be that way, I am that way. And this, these verses urge us, grow more and more. Growing, increasing. Um, how are we doing with our disciple groups? Are we faithful in attendance? Are we growing? Are we increasing? Can we increase to weekly meetings if we're only meeting every other week? Can we incre increase the weekly meetings? And be growing and growing and growing more and more in love and kindness with one another. Yes, the Spirit of God can help us do that, and it's, it's certainly pleasing to Him. Another reference that's similar to this 2.12, please go with me to 2 Thessalonians 1. We're not going to get into this deeply now, but I'll share a little. 2 Thessalonians 1.4. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience. Now this is after some time, second letter. They're still practicing, developing, and growing as Christians. Some of the same virtues, patience, and faith in your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Think with me this through this. Which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God. They are enduring persecutions and tribulations they were endure keep the word endure in your mind a minute which is the manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God enduring well and worthy of the kingdom of God kind of go together how we're serving today will give us greater opportunity to serve then How we're serving today will give us greater opportunity to serve, to serve then. This is not how we enter the kingdom. We enter the kingdom by being born again. Go to John 3 for that. But the opportunity to serve in a greater capacity can be developed here as we endure well today. Continuing on in 2 Thessalonians 1, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Paul had a real knowledge of the kingdom of God in living today, and uh, I wish there was uh, yeah opportunity to learn more, but we'll keep studying the text of Scripture and see what we find on this subject. I uh, can't speak to Paul right now, so we'll, we'll just have to get by. But verse 6, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and give you, and give you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. In other words, we're going to have rest in the, in the, in the, when Jesus is revealed from heaven. Is this the rapture or the second coming? When he comes with his mighty angels, second coming, <laughs> after the rapture, seven years later, that's going to be rest, serving, and, and, and it goes on to talk about how he's going to take vengeance and so on, but jump to verse 11, please. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling. He says that twice in this chapter, that we would be worthy of his calling uh, he's calling us today into the kingdom, and the concept is that we would be worthy of that. What is that talking about? What is this worthiness? What, what is going on? 2 Timothy 2, please. I'm putting together what I could find here close by and uh, delight to share with you. 2 Timothy 2.10. Therefore, I endure, here's our, our word, endure all things for the sake of the elect. Who's, who is the elect? That they also may obtain salvation. It's people who are going to be saved. That they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. 
Then he says this. This is a faithful saying. We understand that. It's God's word, but he makes that statement. This is a faithful saying. If we died with him, we shall also live with him. How many of us as believers have died with Christ? We, that's part of being saved. We died spiritually with Christ. We're, we're, we're united with him. Baptism indicates that. We died to self and brought up out of the waters of baptism to be, live in newness of life. Verse 12, if we endure, we shall also what? What? Have you seen this before? We shall also reign with him. Friends, I'd like to try to put it together briefly. God is calling us to a greater opportunity to serve him with a greater potential of glorifying him than we could ever imagine here on this earth. This is not about how we get into the kingdom. This is about how we get to serve in the kingdom. Worthy today, greater opportunity then. If we sit, don't do much, come now, come then, aren't really growing in our personal lives, we won't have the same opportunity to glorify God, to honor him in the millennial kingdom for a thousand years. What God is doing is, come on, live for him, honor him, obey him, serve him, grow and love more and more and more so that we can have so much greater an opportunity. It seems to me that's what this is describing. Perhaps it's at the, at the judgment seat of Christ where rewards will be given out, crowns and other uh, reward opportunities. Perhaps it's then that, we will, that, that believers will be rewarded for their faithful service and endurance here to serve God in greater capacity than we could ever imagine. That should motivate us a little, don't you think? That should draw our attention to the future, to walk worthy of God. We're born again to enter, but we can be given greater opportunity if we serve in a worthy way here. You want to see another verse? I debated whether to go there. Second Peter. Some of you have probably seen this. There's a uh, Second Peter chapter one is a marvelous description of virtues. Jim Berg wrote a, a book called Essential Virtues, and I've preached through this series before this marvelous passage. But go with me to verse 10, 2 Peter 1.10. Therefore, my brethren, be even more diligent to make your, calling and, your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, it's not, it's abundantly. Do you see that? It's not, we're, we're born again to enter. <laughs> but it sounds like there can be a big entrance if we really serve the Lord. And that big entrance isn't for our benefit. Our, you know, it's not a pat on the back. It's not, oh, look at so-and-so for what they've done and how they've served. It's to look at God for what he did in my life. For so an entrance will be ministered so each of these passages urges us to a, war, a walk that's worthy of God. I hope it's a blessing. I know I didn't answer all questions if this is new, but there's enough there for us to feast on and meditate on and grow in. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this marvelous passage and this concept that you're calling us to serve you with all we've got. All that you equip us to serve, help us to be faithful, enduring well and serving you well. We thank you for the prospect and the promise of being able to enter your kingdom, first of all, but then to also to be able to serve you in a way that seems to be described here as above and beyond anything we could imagine. Father, to be able to bring glory to your name on a multiplied level from what we can experience here would be awesome. Please make that happen for more and more. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.